Good evening and, um, and welcome to PNP Live. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we have a great event for you uh, this evening featuring Glenn Frankel and his terrific new book, a Shooting Midnight Cowboy. I've known Glenn for several decades now from the time we overlapped at the Washington Post and have always admired his writing. He spent 27 years at the paper and earned a reputation as a, a journalist journalist, enterprising, smart, fair-minded. Uh, he was uh, quite an accomplished foreign correspondent serving two stints in London, one in South Africa and one in Israel where his reporting won a Pulitzer Prize in 1989. His experiences abroad also led to two books, Beyond the Promised Land about the Arab-Israeli conflict and Ravonia's Children about white activists who got immersed in South Africa's anti-apartheid movement. Back in Washington, Glenn served for a while as editor of the Post Sunday Magazine. And after leaving journalism, he spent time teaching it, first at Stanford as a visiting professor and later at the University of Texas in Austin, where he headed the School of Journalism. In more recent years, Glenn has turned to writing fascinating, revealing books about great American movies. He did this with two Westerns, The Searchers and High Noon, and he's done it again with Midnight Cowboy, a 1969 film directed by John Schlesinger and starring John Voight and Dustin Hoffman that became the first and only X-rated movie to win the Oscar for Best Picture. It's a raw and taboo-breaking film about a Texas hustler trying to survive on the streets of New York. It was a movie that pushed boundaries, addressing homosexuality, prostitution, and sexual assault. In shooting Midnight Cowboy, Glenn not only goes behind the scenes into how the movie got made, but places it in the context of its times, the social upheaval of the 1960s, New York City's grittiness, and Hollywood in a time of transition. Reviews of the book have drawn raves, NPR said it's a must read for anyone interested in cinematic history. Kirk Kirkus called it a rare cinema book that is as mesmerizing as its subject. And USA Today hailed it as a masterfully structured study bursting with detail and context. So I encourage all of you watching to go out and, and read it if you haven't already. Now Glenn will be in conversation with David Marinus, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, who also has a long association with the Washington Post uh, and has succeeded as well um, at book writing. He's authored excellent biographies of Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Roberto Clemente, and Vince Lombardi, and a trilogy about the 1960s, including works on the Rome Summer Olympics, Detroit, and the conflict among Americans uh, over the Vietnam War. David's most recent book, his 12th, is A Good American Family, she came out two years ago and told the very moving story of his dad, Elliot Marinus, who was himself a gifted newspaperman blacklisted during the McCarthy period. Now, for those of you not familiar with how this virtual format works, uh, although you're not visible to us, you'll still be able to ask a question if you'd like. To do so, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screens. The chat function also will be active, and in that column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of Shooting Midnight Cowboy. So Glenn and David, take it away. Well, thank you, Brad. Um, you took care of a lot of the introductions. I don't have to worry about any of that. We can get right at it after I say that, that Glenn and I have been friends for 40 years and it's been a delight to talk to him about books over that whole period. Um, and I wish we were together at your bookstore, Brad. Um, but I hear we have a standing room only virtual crowd. So we'll pretend that we're all there together. Uh, it's both of our home courts and it's, can't wait to get back to actually being inside bookstores. So anyway, Glenn, great to see you. Great um, to see you, David, even at this distance. <laughs> so let's just get right at it. I mean, Brad took care of sort of, a, I wanted to do a little synopsis of the, of the story, but we don't even have to do that. So. Let's start with you just telling me what drew you to this story? What questions did you want to answer? What themes were the most evocative for you to write a book about? Well, as you know, I'd sort of stumbled into this interesting little subgenre of books that take a, a great American movie 
uh, and uh, talk about the making of that movie, but at the same time, talk about the era that it was made in and the way it reflects that era. And it's allowed me to toggle back between movie and history. Um, the first two were about truly iconic American Westerns, The Searchers and then High Noon. Uh, the logical thing to do was Shane next, uh, <laughs> but I was gonna avoid that at all costs. I love Shane, but I didn't really see what I was looking for there. Mm -hmm. I wanted something more modern. Uh, I was looking for something in that sort of time period of the 60s, uh, which was a turbulent time, both obviously in American politics, um, just about as turbulent as the era we're in now. Yep. Uh, but, uh, and, uh, but also a movie that was taking place at the time when Hollywood was undergoing a lot of changes. And so the late 60s certainly was a, a good target of opportunity. I mean, as, as we both know, having grown up and gone to college in that era, you know, the late 60s, the assassination of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy, the Vietnam War is raging. Uh, New, Richard Nixon's been elected and George Wallace has been appealing to a, a part of the country that, uh, you know, a, a backlash movement similar to what we have today. So that was rich territory to think about. New York was also changing. New York had after the war it had been the capital of the world in many ways, both culturally and economically, but things were beginning to go downhill in New York in a very serious way. And the movie business was changing dramatically mm -hmm. then. So the time had all of the things I was looking for. Uh, I kicked around with various ideas. I'd seen Midnight Cowboy when it came out. I know it's always been sort of hovering there, you know, in the top 40 list near the bottom, people know about it. I'd seen it several times. When I started looking into it, I found A, there wasn't a book devoted to the movie. That's very helpful to know. And B, that um, it, it touched on a lot of these themes. It had a lot going for it. So in the end, I had no idea how rich it would be. Uh, you never know till you get going, mm -hmm. all the things you uncover and all the things I learned along the way. And we can talk about some of those, but so I, I, it was very rewarding, very difficult in some ways very personal because I had been in New York in that era as well. But, um, you know, I found I could cover all that ground, the politics and the movie making and have a really interesting time. One of the really great things about preparing for this conversation was that I watched the movie again. Mm. I'd, I'd seen it, you know, it's more than 50 years, right? Unbelievably, because in some ways it's a modern movie, but in some ways it's anachronistic, but it, it feels, it has a grittiness that feels more modern, but it's 50 years ago. But anyway, I want I want everybody watching and listening to know that that reading Glenn's book and then, which I did early, and then seeing the movie just illuminates it in so many fascinating ways that it's a wonderful experience to draw on what you learned from the book and then watch the movie. Um, the uh, yeah, I mean, is it just coincidence, Glenn, that all three books are sort of about cowboys in a way? I mean, did that come up in your thinking? Or I mean, of course, they're they're really not. I mean, each one of them has a larger uh, theme, sort of exploding different American myths. You know. The idea of a trilogy sort of was appealing on one level. On the okay. other hand, I moved from one publisher to another in the middle, so um, we weren't going to package it that way. I I had a section in Midnight Cowboy that talked about its westernness, and in the end, I just thought, no, let it speak more for itself. Yeah. I mean, yes, this is a guy from Texas, a lonely, a lonely, troubled guy who's looking to find his place in the world, and he takes the Greyhound up to New York. Um, as someone who came to New York looking for my own life, I understand what he was going through. But he's, he's and he, he adopts a cowboy style. He's not a cowboy in Texas. He's actually, he'd been in the, an army veteran. He'd been working as a waiter and a busboy in a restaurant. You know, he's a nobody, a mm -hmm. uh, handsome guy, very isolated, abandoned by his mother, raised very loosely by his grandmother um, on his own. He's looking, as I say, to find a way to live in the world. And he buys a cowboy outfit, gets the cowboy hat and the suede jacket and the boots and all that. But as he himself says, I ain't no cowboy, but I'm a hell of a stud. 
That's his self-definition. He's coming to New York to be a male hustler. Yeah. So sure, you can talk about masculinity and its various forms and how that plays out, you know, in High Noon and The Searchers and now in Midnight Cowboy. There is an element of that. It's, they're all American stories. That's really what it boils down to, I think, more than anything else. There are stories about our identity and, and our effort to find a way uh, to be successful and to do the right thing is however we define it. And so that's an American story. I think it's much more that than a cowboy story. But, you know, you've been to Texas. You lived in Texas for a while. I did, too. It's rich terrain for all of this. Springs, Big Springs, Texas. You know, uh, one of the, the fascinating contrasts of the book is that that you ground it in the written word, in a sense. And yet, in, in, study, in, in your fascinating sort of exploration of how a movie is made, you see that the words are almost, I'm not superfluous, but it's the images that count in the end. And yet, you can't create the images without that written word. So let's go back to the, the genesis of the written word in this case, which is um, the book and this amazing character, Jim Hurley. Um, a closeted gay kid, uh, handsome, dark Irish eyes from Detroit. Um, how did he come about writing this book? And what, what, do you, what did we learn about him? Jim's a sort of classic figure from the 40s. You know, he, as you say, he comes from Detroit, a working class background, barely makes it through high school, desperate to sort of escape home. But he has a vision of himself as a writer, as an artist with a capital A. Uh, it's not only writing, in fact, uh, he goes to, uh, to acting school for a while. He goes to art school in North Carolina on the GI Bill. He runs into some people here and there, and most especially uh, uh, Anais Nin, uh, who we it's remember now. To see I know. Is the, uh, yeah. She's the great erotic diarist. But back yeah. in, in the late 1940s, when she goes down to North Carolina to the school and meets Jim, She's a struggling writer. I mean, she's having trouble breaking in in New York. Nobody's interested in the kind of stuff she likes to do. She's a very resentful, angry mm -hmm. person, but she's very attracted to Jim, who's 20 years old and a handsome devil and, and, uh, and excited to see her and to meet someone who is truly trying to be an artist. And so they, had, they formed this partnership, if you will. I mean, she's interested in him uh, sexually, but he's a young gay guy and he's not so much, but he's fascinated by her and her self-concept. So Jim, uh, as I say, makes his way. First he's told, well, you're not gonna succeed as an author. So you might think about acting, goes to acting school, makes his way, it starts writing plays, and working in the theater, makes his way to New York in the early fifties. And he's like this flood of young people coming to New York in that era who wanna find themselves. He hooks on to the sort of periphery of the gay arts community in New York. Again, a handsome young guy. Everybody likes him. He's very social. He gets around and he has success. Uh, she helps hook him up with a number of people at the Paris Review, for example. Mm -hmm. He writes a novel that actually is quite successful, All Fall Down, his first novel, and it's made into a movie. He writes a play that's on Broadway for six months called Blue Denim. He's a complicated guy because he suffers from depression and every now and then things just go haywire for him and he disappears for long stretches or he goes home or he tries different things. But Jim is making it in New York. And, you know, I was hoping Jim would show me around Times Square. He's been dead since 1993, but I was hoping he would leave me papers and letters and all those clues we look for. Well, he doesn't do it, but you do it. <laughs> well, he won't. He, no, he doesn't do it for me. But Nin helps me out because yeah. she writes about him and collects things from him. I was very lucky to meet a man who was Jim's partner for an eight to ten year period in New York. A guy named Dick Dwayne, who was a nightclub singer and a very handsome young guy. And Dick, who died recently, um, was very helpful to me. Really loved Jim deeply and understood him. But um, called him Jamie, right? Yes. Well, Jamie was the name that he had from childhood and the name oh. that he later adopted for himself when he becomes, uh, I don't know what quite the word I would use is, but, but it's part of his new self-image. Jim is uh -huh. trying on different 
roles and different narratives for his own life over time. That's one of the kind of interesting, infuriating things about him. He never sticks to one story. He's interviewed a lot in newspapers and here and there. They never answer, ask him the question. The one question I wanted answered that you'll, that, that's missing in the book. Where'd you get Joe Buck? The character. Who, sure. who how takes, much of, how much of Jim is Joe? Well, I think a lot in the end. I think a lot. I think that sense of isolation. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jim's a, Jim's a smart guy and Joe is uh, not so smart. Uh, Jim's not naive. But nonetheless, these are people trying to find a way to exist. Um, they're vulnerable people. They've got a lot of armor. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of, of uh, Jim there, but I never could nail that down. And every time he was asked about Joe Buck, which was rarely, he'd make up some story about, well, he invaded my consciousness and I couldn't get rid of him. That's the way folks talked in New York, I think in the late fifties. Uh, he just, so, uh, but Jim, Jim eventually, he loves New York and then he doesn't love New York. And he ends up in Key West actually mm -hmm. after that and becomes close for a while with Tennessee Williams, the great playwright who's living down there and sort of holding court down in Key West. And Jim loves hanging out with writers, with artists. He gradually sees himself becoming this thing. It's hard for him constantly uh, because writing is hard. Writing is the most difficult thing for him. But I, I found him, he's, nobody knows James Leo Hurley he anymore. He's, he's kind of been lost, his reputation has been lost. And I don't know how many people are even reading Midnight Cowboy, the novel. I recommend it because it's, it's one of the great books I think of the early 60s. Um, and it's a different kind of novel than almost anything you'll read. He doesn't tell me in his diaries and letters what he did at Times Square, but Midnight Cowboy tells me a lot sure. <laughs> because he knows the culture. He knows how to hustle on the street. He knows how to avoid the cops. You know, all yeah. the stuff that Jim had to have learned himself when he's down there in Times Square. So I use, you know, you use what you can. Sure. Uh, and, and in the end, I was very, very lucky to have Nin, to have Dick Duane, to have other people with memories of Jim that really helped me fill in the blanks. When I was reading your book, I mean, it seemed to me that, that, that 42nd Street, Times Square was a central character in the book. So evoke that that place in the 1960s, what was it? Well, you know, I even remember it a bit physically what it looked like. It was starting to deteriorate quite a bit. There's 42nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenues is the heart of it. And there were like 12 or maybe 14 different movie houses. Some were grind houses that showed, you know, double features for 50 cents or whatever. There were porno houses, but there was also like one theater, the Astor, that was a, a well-known foreign film center. I mean, and people would flock there to go to movies. You know, I looked at memoirs of various people saw like people like Bob Dylan who went to see double features down there back in the early 60s. At the same time, there are lots of hustlers on the street. Joe Buck, uh, the, the, the hero of Midnight Cowboy, thinks he comes to New York thinking he's gonna be a male hustler, but he thinks the kind of clientele he's gonna hustle are middle-aged affluent women, women. Looking, for, looking for sex. And, Gigolo, right. and if you've ever been down the Times Square, well, in those days, there are no middle-aged affluent women looking around for male hustlers in Times Square, but there are gay men looking around in various forms. And, and, and that's what Joe finds. And so already we're in an interesting sort of sexual identity question of mm -hmm. who is Joe Buck and what's he doing? Times Square, you know, has attracted people. It's been the sort of enter sleazy entertainment center of New York for almost a century. And it attracted during the war, for example, a lot of young men went down there, soldiers. Some of them were looking for a heterosexual action and prostitutes. But a lot of gay men, especially from smaller towns around the country, found that for the first time they weren't alone, that there were a lot of other people just like them and you could find them in Times Square. And people like Gore Vidal write about going down there and Tennessee Williams himself uh, and his friends wander around there. So it becomes a kind of almost a haven. The cops tend to leave you alone down there, even in that era, even though you know sodomy is illegal in 49 states, including New York. The mob takes over some of the porno houses in various places and, 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 the, and the gay bars. And so people are kind of protected. The cops go along, they get paid off. It's Sodom and Gomorrah, but you know, 
more Sodom than Gomorrah. I mean, it's a, it's not a really a dangerous place. It's a place where people can have a life. And I, I talked to a few people like Sam Delaney, who spent time there hustling. Um, for him, for Sam, and he, I think he romanticizes it a little bit. It was a safe place. It was a place where he could meet other men, uh, where he could have sex as regularly as he wanted to in the movie house balconies. It was wide open in that way. And therefore, it's a kind of a really interesting place to look at. And since I couldn't get Jim to show me around, um, there were other people like Dotson Rader who came there in 1960, a, a novelist and author who got off the bus and literally began to have a life down there and others. And I sort of mixed and matched and got a lot of pieces of things and put them together. One thing that I didn't realize, although I probably should have, was you think of New York, you know, the, the liberal establishment there as being accepting and understanding um, and uh, a place where, where gay people would feel safe and, and appreciated. Um, and yet when you explored what it was like in the, in the 1960s and what they had to deal with from that liberal establishment, it was quite different. This surprised me too. And um, you know, these books are among other things, a great learning experience. Oh. And I learned about, yes, you'd think in, in New York, but the, the heart of American liberalism that gay people at least would be tolerated or uh, there would be some sympathy. But New York was also sort of the headquarters of the psychoanalytical priesthood, priesthood mm -hmm. as I call them in the book, the Freudians who thought they understood what homosexuality was and that it was uh, essentially a, a disorder, a mental disorder uh, that, you know, weak, weak fathers and uh, strong mothers created gay men. And so if you could create gay people, of course, you could uncreate them, you could cure them. And so conversion therapy, which we now associate you know, with right-wing evangelical mm -hmm. uh, movement, actually was something that the psychoanalytical community, which thought it's, of itself as very liberal, very liberal, uh, was pushing heavily. And when you read the pages, say, of the New York Times, or you read Harper's Magazine, or you read the New York Review of Books, not every, you know, not frequently, but every now and then there's a piece in there that really is, is, is brutal. Um, and I quote from some of them in the book. Um, the idea was that if being, if being a homosexual was a curable disease, if you didn't cure yourself, you were being immoral, you were spreading something. It was con almost a contagion and you could spread it to young people. So it had to be it had to be wiped out through psychoanalytical therapy, through other ways. This was the, the attitude right up into the late 60s when Midnight Cowboy is made. This is still the general attitude. I mean, this awful piece uh, cover story on uh, homosexuals in Harper's Magazine is from 1970. Mm -hmm. It's only at that time. And incidentally, that's one of the things that made the book so interesting is that Midnight Cowboy is made in 68. It comes out in 69. It premieres about a month before the Stonewall riots. That's right. and, and so attitudes are really beginning to change in, in a serious way. And, and that too was part of the story in the end. And Midnight Cowboy having been written by a gay man and the movie as we'll talk about was made by John Schlesinger, the British director who also happens to be a gay man. Mm -hmm. These are two very exuberant guys who are very comfortable in their, with their sexuality but they're both in the closet publicly because they don't wanna ruin their careers. But they write a book and then make a movie that very much is a modern uh, adult movie that treats homosexuality in a much different way than we were used to. And it's part of the breaking down of barriers that both in politics and in culture and in popular culture that the late 60s is all about. We'll get to Schlesinger and to the producer. You know, there were so many people in the creation of this movie who were struggling right at that moment when this movie was made. But first I wanna to get to John Boyd because I just find him, you know, just such an incredible study of, you know, we think of John Boyd today as this nutcase, right? A Trumpster um, in every possible way. And yet he comes across in your book and probably in life as this incredibly sympathetic, understanding human being who really connected with Joe Buck and, fought to get that role, right? Yeah. Um, but, but, but was the one who understood the loneliness of this man. And, and just his portrayal of Joe Buck is, I think, brilliant. So tell us more about Joe. 
Yeah, I was surprised by John Voight, I have to admit. I, I talked to a lot of people about him before I met him because I didn't know if I'd actually ever get right. the chance to interview him. But when I finally did, he started out by asking me some very pointed questions about the media and what's wrong with this and that. Uh -huh. and, you know, I, I tried to fend him off. Um, right. But then he looked at me and he said, but you're here to talk about Midnight Cowboy, right? And, and after that, he kind of, his face sort of changed. He loosened up mm -hmm. and he started talking about this movie and how badly he had wanted to be in it and how uh -huh. badly he wanted to be an actor and how it all came together for him. You know, he's a boy from Yonkers, New York. He's just up the road from New York City. Uh, but he came to New York to find himself also. And he, and he, he goes to acting school and he struggles with bits, parts for a while. He's, he's somebody who never really thought he was gonna be a big movie star. He had heard about Midnight Cowboy. He had read the novel and he loved it. He had, you know, for a young guy who's struggling. He had read the novel. Yeah. Yes, he had read the novel. And he just thought, this is fantastic. This is something I could do. Uh -huh. uh, and when he finds out John Schlesinger is making a movie, he does everything he can to get seen for it. Uh, he just thinks, John Voight is a guy who goes all the way, whatever it is, he commits to 100%. That's why, so when he's 100%, a young kid in New York and he, he's on the left, mm -hmm. he goes to the Chicago 7 trial with his girlfriend mm -hmm. to show solidarity with, with Abby Hoffman. When he's on the right, he's all in favor of, of Donald Trump. It's 100% of everything and 100% of being an actor. He was totally committed to this thing. He thought they couldn't even make the movie without him. Uh, and he was really disappointed when John Schlesinger didn't want him in the movie, but he fought for it. He had the support of the casting director, a woman I'd never heard of, Marion Doherty, who is the, turns out to be the great New York casting director and who kept index cards on all these guys and women in the profession and really thought Voight was the right person for this movie as well. So meeting him and figuring out what this guy was really like and this portrait of him as this totally committed actor, generous, helpful, creative, yeah. understanding loneliness, getting inside the character. Um, I, it was very impressive. That's really what sold them on him in the end, wasn't it? That he understood the character in a way that, that the screenwriter wanted someone to understand it. He knew the vulnerability of this yeah. guy. He knew the comedy that you could get out of this yeah. hick coming to New York yeah. and how to do that without making fun of the guy. He also knew that there was a, a core of violence, a potential for violence in this guy um, to, to, that he could play with. And that is part of the movie as well. J Joe Buck is not a simple person. He's struggling to find his way, uh, but he's an angry guy as well, because as I say, he's grown up with nobody. He's an isolated man. So the thing can go either way. And John Boyd understood that I think better than anyone. Well, the violence near the end of the movie is shocking. You know, um, is it in the book? I forget. It totally is in the book. Yeah, All yeah, of the yeah. it, it follows it pretty closely, doesn't it? It, it yeah. does. All of the major scenes in New York are actually in the book, and a lot of the dialogue uh, is in the book. Yeah, and then he plays off, you know, Joe Buck and Rezzo Rizzo, uh, the better known actor at that time, Dustin Hoffman. Um, and what did he bring to this role and how did he create Ratso? Well, you know, Hoffman is another guy who comes to New York to become an actor. He's five foot six, got a large Jewish nose, I would say. And the idea that he might be a movie star was the furthest thing from his mind. He's thinking he's gonna be a theatrical actor and he's gonna work his way up and maybe someday get to play in a Tennessee Williams play or something like that. But Mike Nichols chooses Hoffman uh, as Benjamin Braddock in The Graduate. And in, so in 1967, suddenly Hoffman uh, is a star and not just a movie star, he's like a counterculture icon because you know The Graduate is a generation gap movie. It yep. speaks to a new audience of moviegoers and Hoffman is terrific in it, that, that, that sly sense of humor, the methods that he learned as an actor he brings to this. So suddenly he's a big star. And interestingly enough, John Schlesinger, the director of Midnight Cowboy, didn't even want him in the movie at that point. He didn't want to have some new movie star to mess up his little movie. Hoffman well, we could have had a movie without Hoffman or Boyd. It's impossible to imagine now, but Schlesinger, now? Schlesinger didn't want either one. Who of could them. it have been in those two roles? 
Well, you know, Robert Redford and uh, wanted yeah. that film. Uh, they really liked, uh, Schlesinger really liked a guy named Michael Sarazen. Uh -huh. Very handsome young actor, good actor, you know, who's in They Shoot Horses with Jane Fonda right. and a few right. other Which things. was the same year, right? Didn't it come out? That's right. Movie? That's right. Yeah. And yeah. Sarazen really wanted the role. Uh, yeah. And in fact, that's who Schlesinger wanted. And he, he offered him the part. They even fitted uh, Sarazen with costumes. But the Sarazen was signed to another studio, which, uh, which raised his price quite a lot. Uh -huh. And these guys didn't have much money. They'd already actually promised a lot of money to Dustin Hoffman after he became a star. So uh, uh, Celeste, Jerry Hellman, the producer of the movie who I met with said, well, we kept watching, you know, the filmed auditions and we'd watch Voight and then we'd watch Sarazen. And each time we watched uh, Voight, we got a little, he looked a little better and each time Sarazen looked a little worse. Mm -hmm. So they were able to get Voight for almost no money. He wasn't their idea of what this guy should be. The idea of, of Voight, the big tall blonde guy and Hoffman, the little dark five foot six guy who we know now to be, the perfect people for this part were both sort of accidentally cast in this thing. I was interested in how Hoffman found his persona, which is defined by two things, I would say, his limp and his voice. I talked to him about the voice and he still is not sure himself. Uh, he moves himself up an octave. I, I've, seen a, right. I've seen a film of a play he was in and the voice is there in this earlier play, uh, but raising raising his voice an octave, giving it, he, he, he's from LA. It's a funny thing, you know, the, the, the little Jewish guy who looks like he's from New York actually was born and raised in right. LA. The big tall Texas cowboy is actually from Yonkers. He's right. the real New Yorker. Well, uh, that's acting, it's all. It's all acting and, and Hoffman, um, studies this thing. He reads the novel carefully. He told me he got a lot of things like the limp, for example, directly from the novel. Mm -hmm. And the dialogue in the novel, as I say, he worked with that. So he just, he's, these guys both create characters from inside. You know, they build them slowly. They had both worked in the theater. They knew each other vaguely. They really worked, they challenged each other, especially in the early rehearsals to do improv, to do things, to bring each other out. And they develop the characteristics of the kind of characters they are in that period. And so when they make the movie, they know exactly what they're doing. As I remember it, Hoffman didn't even know his voice until they were filming a, a non-sound, walking over a bridge and all of a sudden he started, it came out. Well, Schlesinger, after choosing them, wanted to get some early footage of them on the bridge when the weather was really gray and nasty. Right. You know, this was March heading into April and he knew, you know, he wouldn't get this chance. So he asked them to go up on the bridge and, and walk together. And Hoffman, Hoffman already had his walk. Voight didn't have his. <laughs> uh, and neither of them had the accent or the, the voice. Uh, Schlesinger said, don't worry, just talk to each other. We'll dub it all in later. But they, you know, these two guys were really reluctant to be filmed on the bridge because they're, they're building something and they haven't finished building it yet. It's like asking, you know, uh, a painter to give you a half finished painting. Mm -hmm. they, they, and they understood each other. Uh, Hoffman was so worked up as he was crossing over that he actually threw up. And uh, uh, that day he was so nervous about it. And, and some of it landed on Voight's cowboy boot. <laughs> And Voight takes Schlesinger aside and Perfect. says, is he going to do this throughout the movie? You know, I mean, it was, uh, uh, they were getting used to each other. Uh, they say uh, they were, they were quite the acting pair once they got going. Well, you know, for all of the darkness in this movie, it's also a love story, right? It, it is. It's not your standard buddy movie. It's not like uh, no. Redford and Newman and, you know, Butch Cassidy, which right. is, came out the same time. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. not that because these guys have nobody. Yeah. And they don't trust each other either. They're such different people. I mean, Joe is this little, you know, this handsome but schlumpy guy from Texas. Hoffman is a, a disabled con man from the Bronx, a homeless guy. They have nothing in common accept their loneliness and accept their vulnerability. And it takes them a long time to trust each other, even enough to own up to a little of that. I mean, the Hoffman character, Razzo Rizzo, you know, cons Joe Buck out of 20 bucks. He's just right. another New York predator at the beginning of this thing. And Joe is an easy mark for all these folks. Yep. But gradually, as time goes on, these are both desperate guys and winter is coming. They're essentially homeless. 
New York's a lonely, difficult place uh, when you don't have a few bucks in your wallet and when you don't have a place to live either, it's really hard. And so they, they come together over their sort of mutual need, but it's always not clear where it's gonna go. I mean, John Schlesinger is not interested in telling a redemptive story okay. of, uh, of romance or acceptance. He, okay. he leaves a lot of doors open. He's not gonna let us have the easy way out. Well, in the end, it's not an easy way out, but you do feel something between them in a stronger way than, than I would have imagined. Yeah, you do. You really do. You don't know what's going to happen yeah, with right. Joe Buck at the end of the movie. I mean, on the one hand, he's thrown away the cowboy clothes. He's yep. tried to rescue his buddy. Uh, he's done the right thing. But is he really redeemed at the same time? He's just beaten a man nearly to death back in New York to get the money to go to Florida mm -hmm. with his buddy. There's 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 nothing nothing sure. And when some people tried to talk John Schlesinger out of having that that really brutal scene, he said, no, it's got to be there. This is not a fairy tale movie. This is a movie, you know, I'm trying to make this real. And so it's Schlesinger's sort of vision of what this needs to be that really carries it through in the end. And that was very risky, I think. You know, going back to my original concept of it relying on the written word, um, you make it so clear that this movie would have been a disaster or not made if not for Waldo Salt. Uh, who came in to really save the movie in a way, don't you think? Yeah, I agree. He's the screenwriter. Yep. Um, I, uh, you know, these books often end up being a lot about writers. Uh, <laughs> and Waldo is a really interesting writer because oh, yeah. he's a writer who didn't believe in words. Uh, Waldo got into the motion picture business in the late 30s uh, as a very young man. And he saw, along with some others in Hollywood, like Joe Mankiewicz, uh, the director producer who was Waldo's mentor originally, mm -hmm. he saw movies as an entirely different medium that required different kinds of screenplays. Um, he, he laughed at the studios that were bringing in people like William Faulkner and F. Scott Fitzgerald to write their screenplays because he didn't think the word was, was what it was about. It's the image. It's what you do with the images. And he felt you, you, know, you build the words around presenting the images. It was almost like, like poetry. He thought it was an entirely new art form, writing for the screen. And Waldo was a strong believer in that. And some of his early movies are quite right. good. Yeah. yeah. The problem, though, is Waldo's a mess. Also, he's a <laughs> lifelong uh, heavy drinker. Um, he's a member of the American Communist Party. And so uh, when the Red Scare comes along- A the familiar movie, theme for both of us. Yeah, so I was going to say, you know all about this, David, from your last book and from what happened to your dad. And, and you from I know. Yeah. Yes. And so Waldo is blacklisted. Uh, you know, he refuses to rat out his friends in the party. Mm -hmm. uh, he can't work under his own name for more than a decade. He's drinking heavily. He takes his family, his wife and his two kids to New York, hoping they can escape the blacklist by being there. That doesn't work out. The marriage is falling apart. He's writing a few uh, scripts uh, for television shows. The money's bad. His life is a mess. And even after the blacklist ends, he's in crisis in a big way. Meanwhile, though, John Schlesinger and the producer Jerry Hellman are desperate to get a good screenwriter for this movie. They try out one guy in New York, a playwright, who gives them uh, a script that doesn't work at all. John isn't, Schlesinger, you know, he's interested in portraying the sexual elements of it and, uh, and New York in that era, but he's most interested in these two guys. And he needs someone who can Especially give him- Especially Joe, that. right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, they fire the early guy uh, a, 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 an agent named George Leto talks to Jerry and says, I've got a guy who I think could do this for you. He, he's living in New York. He know he understands New York. And I think he's, and he's hungry. Give him a shot. And, you know, Waldo writes a memo about the movie and about the novel. And Jerry loves it. And he sends it to John Schlesinger in the UK, who also loves it. And they give Waldo a shot. And sure enough, I mean, it, he drives them crazy because he's drinking and he's actually making the transition from alcohol to marijuana. Uh, it's impossible to get Waldo to write things down, to give them pages. Mm -hmm. He's just talking about characters constantly and images, but they work, they rent a place in Malibu. They go out there and hide out. And eventually with Waldo, they developed, I think one of the great movie scripts. And sure enough for Waldo, it was a wonderful experience 
and he and he won the Oscar for best adapted screenplay for this. So this was for Waldo. This was totally redemptive. Also, he's there when they're making the movie. He's on the set every day. He's working with Hoffman and Boyd. He loves these young guys. Mm -hmm. And um, he said later it was the great experience of his, the working experience of his life to do this movie. The movie also, um, Schlesinger, the director, was also coming out of a very rough period when this movie sort of saved him too, right? You know, they had no idea with what, what they were getting with Waldo, but Jerry Hellman, a, a producer, an independent producer in New York who wanted to do a movie with Schlesinger, Jerry's last movie had bombed. Yep. His wife was get, was divorcing him. Uh, meanwhile, his two kids were in New York. He was in L.A. Meanwhile, what was the uh, last movie? Uh, Far oh, from the Madding Crowd, was it? Or? No. Oh, Jerry's movie was a fine madness. Oh, oh, John oh, Connery. Yeah. The really, uh, you know, which did you know? None of us have ever heard of it. Uh, yeah. John Schlesinger had made some nice little movies in the UK, including Darling, this wonderful yeah, uh, movie about that. swinging London with Julie. Everybody Rick. who loves. Uh, <laughs> The actress knows that movie, yeah. She, yeah, I mean, Julie Christie just Julie knocked Christie. out every young man in America with that. And, and Schlesinger was so good with her that she won the Academy Award for Best Actress for her first starring role. Mm -hmm. So Schlesinger was the hot thing for a while, but MGM then gives him a couple million dollars to make Far From the Madding Crowd, this Thomas Hardy uh, saga. And, and he hires Julie Christie to play this 19th century uh, farm woman and, and it flops. It's, you know, it's a mess. So Schlesinger, who thinks he's going to come to America and be anointed the next big thing, comes to America with a flop on his hands and this idea to make a movie out of this bleak little novel that the studios have already all turned down. Uh, and he and, and, you know, nobody says yes to him. Nobody wants to know him until Jerry takes him to this to United Artists, the sort of anti studio studio. Uh, you know, unlike MGM and Paramount and these big places, United Artists didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have a big studio complex out in LA. They made individual deals with movie makers uh, along the way and they took risks. They're the guys, they were doing very well. They, they did the James Bond, you know, uh, group of movies that made them a vast fortune. They did A Hard Day's Night, the Beatles movie, made a lot of money off that and off the album that they <laughs> put out. It's the one Beatles album that's United Artists as opposed to Capital. United Artists is willing, and the guy named David Picker, who's their movie selector, if you will, a younger guy, a Dartmouth grad. David Picker really wants to work with John Schlesinger He's willing to, as long as they work for a very shoestring budget, he's willing to let Schlesinger make any movie he wants to make. And Jerry Hellman, the producer who doesn't like the novel either, but who really wants to work with John Schlesinger is willing to do it. So John gets these folks together. He hires all these talented New Yorkers, the uh, talent agent, you know, Marion Doherty, the casting agent, um, Anne Roth, the costume designer. Yeah, that's a great part of your book. I mean. Yeah, and she creates these wonderful outfits for, for yeah. Hoffman and for yeah. Voigt. Anne Roth is 89 years old now, incidentally, and she's just been nominated for the fifth time for the best Oscar. Yeah. I mean, these are amazing people. And the actors, the, the supporting actors yes. uh, who Doherty gets are uh, leading with a woman named Sylvia Miles, mm -hmm. who's been mostly off Broadway she only has six minutes on the screen. She plays an aging hooker. Joe Buck thinks he's who has a tryst, little tryst with Joe Buck, and he thinks he's going to get twenty bucks from her afterwards, and she takes twenty bucks from him instead. I mean, it, it's a very funny uh, scene, and it got Sylvia Miles nominated for Best Supporting Actress for six minutes. Um, this is an enormously talented group of people who all knew they were working on something special. They didn't think it was going to be, you know, make any money. Nobody thought this movie was going to make a dime, but they, they, but they loved doing it. They loved working with each other. And, and it was great to talk to the many of them who are still around about the experience. You know, one of the things we try to do in our books is uh, take the conventional wisdom and turn it on its end and find out what's myth and what's real. And your story about the X rating for this movie um, does that. Uh, first of all, this is right when the rating system is coming into being, right? That's and, right. I mean, this is Hollywood in the late sixties when the old genres like cowboy movies uh, and you know, biblical epics are not really attracting you know, audiences. And 
uh, they're looking for younger audiences. They're looking for the baby boomers to start going to the movies. And so the, they, they scrapped the old censorship system called the production code and they put in the rating system, which was actually an effort, I think, by Hollywood to open things up and give a chance for more adult themes and for movies that might attract younger audiences. Uh, Midnight Cowboy is made and, and it's one of the first films that they rate. Uh, and the ratings board gives it an R for restricted. You can go with your parents if you're 17, say. Um, they think the movie is very serious and important and they're willing to do that. But the folks who run United Artists and most specifically a guy named Arthur Krim, uh, who, who's the head guy there, the folks who had financed the movie, they, they thought it was a really important movie too and they were very proud of it. But Arthur Krim's starting to have cold feet for exactly you know, the reason we were talking about earlier, the sense of homophobia, the sense that the gay sex in Midnight Cowboy is dangerous, that somehow if young people go see that movie, it might influence them to become gay themselves. Crazy idea, uh, but a lot of people believe that in the 60s. And Arthur Krim seeks out a noted uh, psychoanalyst at Columbia University who tells him exactly that. And so Krim turns around and he rates the movie X. Um, his marketers look at that and decide they'll try to use it to their advantage. So you get a marketing campaign that, that's designed to appeal to people who want something new and different. The tagline they use for a while is Midnight Cowboy is everything you've heard it is, you know, everything you've heard of. I mean, so, and, and so it becomes a bit of a selling point, but it was not, it was not rated X originally. The, the word gets out that the prudish rating board, you know, uh, the cowardly rating board rated, rates it X because of the sex in it. The ratings board didn't do that. It was United, United Artists themselves. Now it gets nominated for best picture and then it wins best, best picture. The first X rated movie and the last X rated movie ever to win <laughs> best picture. So of course, at that point, United Artists turns around and says, well, maybe we should rate it R. We'll get, you know, we we'll get the crowd in. The ratings board is a little confused to have them come back to them. They'd rated it at R already and they did it without any, without any dispute. But the legend that's grown up over, over the years is that this was an X rated movie from this cowardly group that then turned around and gave it an R after it won the Oscar. Uh, Jerry Hellman used to say they claimed they wanted us to like cut one frame so that they could re-rate it and say that we changed it. We refused to do that. It's a nice story. I'm guessing Jerry still believes it at this point in his life. It's not true. It's interesting to look at the other movies that were nominated that year and see sort of the cusp between new and old, right? I mean, it beat Hello, Dolly, among others. Yes. <laughs> An Anne of a Thousand it Days, yeah, right. this sort of clunky, you know, the, uh, Elizabethan movie, you know, with Richard Burton and, you know, the old crowd, if you will. I mean, Barbara Streisand was a force of nature. Uh, the other thing, of course, is it beat out Butch Cassidy and the yeah. Sundance Kid, which was right. probably its biggest rival. It also had a pair of buddies uh, yeah. who were wonderful in it, Redford and Newman. Uh, and I think they thought they were going to win Best Picture, and by all rights, um, they should have. I mean, they were a Hollywood movie for. What do you mean movie. by all rights? Do you think well, they should have? No, not that they deserve to win it. No, I'm very, yeah. I, I, you know, yeah. look, I love Butch Cassidy and the Sundance yeah. Kid. Don't get me wrong, but it's not. Yeah, but who well, it's an entertainment. It's a lightweight movie. It's a comedy. It's not too authentic. Raindrops keep falling on my head is the theme song, you know, yeah. from the 19th century in Wyoming. I mean, it just doesn't, you know, it's it's fun. Midnight Cowboy is a serious movie. Um, it's got comedy in it, but it's got a lot of other things in it. No, I think it was the right choice, but I think a lot of people were surprised that this little New York movie got the Oscar. It's another, I think, another indication of how things were changing and how Hollywood was attempting to sort of keep up with the new era. So I'm going to go to some uh, viewer questions now, Glenn. And we have an incredibly distinguished uh, panel of questioners <laughs> who would be in politics and prose if they could be. First is your former boss and our colleague, Jim Hoagland. Ah, How's that? That's... Who asks, what was the reaction of the gay community to the release of Midnight Cowboy? That's a really good question, Jim. It was very much a mixed bag. On the one hand, the gay characters in Midnight Cowboy, the customers, if you will, are you know not very happy figures, really kind of pathetic in some ways. 
you can look at them and say, well, they are victims of the culture of the time, but also they're not depicted in any kind of uh, comfortable or necessarily sympathetic uh, light. And so parts of the gay community were not happy with, with that characterization, but there were other folks who, who noted that, um, you know, the gay scenes in the movie were treated like the um, heterosexual scenes. They weren't, uh, the, the, there wasn't the sense of being gay as a disease or something that would lead to your automatic destruction. Uh, they accepted it as an adult movie so there was a mixed bag. People on the one, I talked to people who, who remember it at the time because of the gay scenes as being something that at least put gay people on the, you know, on the screen and depicted real life and the difficulties out of it. And others who found a lot of homophobia in it. By the same token, there's a lot of misogyny in the movie as well in some ways. The, 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 all of the sex in the movie is very transactional and very- Oh, cool. the early rape scene is, yeah. Yeah, and so you have, you know, it's New York. It's New York in a predatory time. And both gay people and straight people can be the victims and the perpetrators of some of these predatory activities. Mm -hmm. Our fellow writer, Kate Buford. Ah. Uh, she asks, what about the movie being a rather elegant inversion of the American myth of going west to find a new identity and freedom? This flips it to the cowboy going east to New York and running the myth to ground. That's very much the case. And it's a faux cowboy on a Greyhound bus rather than a horse and going to town um, to try to find himself and to try to exist in the world. One of the things, Schlesinger was aware of this. And, and one of the great, one of the things we haven't talked about is the wonderful music behind the movie. But yes. um, mm -hmm. there's Everybody's Talking, which becomes the sort of continuing theme through the movie. But there's another, another uh, instrumental, a harmonica instrumental, just entitled Midnight Cowboy, written mm -hmm. by the great John Barry, who wrote soundtracks for the James Bond movies and all kinds of other things, a very elegant Brit. Mm -hmm. But he writes this harmonica theme that very much you could hear on the prairie if you were, you know, out there, you could almost see tumbleweed going down, you know, Times Square as, as he's playing this song, this harmonica theme that's played while Joe Buck is roaming Times Square. The weather's getting colder, things are getting more desperate. Times Square is like this cold, empty canyon. It's like the empty space out in the West in a, in a, in a curious way. And so uh, that is the Western link, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe Buck's dressed in his cowboy outfit. He's, he's not a real cowboy, but he's looking for, you know, he's trying to find his way. Uh, and so in terms of it's, as I say, if it's all a search for our, our lost masculinity, which is some way, a way that you can interpret cowboy movies from the beginning and John Wayne as well, there's Midnight Cowboy and there's the music that goes with it. All I'd add to that, Kate, is, you know, that one scene where they talk about John Wayne where Dustin Ho the Dustin Hoffman character is making fun of Joe Buck in his cowboy outfit saying, you know, nobody buys that cowboy stuff. That's not gonna get you women. That's only for gays. Uh, and he uses a, another term for that, a really derogatory term. And Joe Buck says, what do you mean? John Wayne? This is what John Wayne wore. Are you saying he was gay? I mean, you know, there, there's a constant struggle over what masculinity is and what's acceptable and what isn't. And the Western gets caught up right in the middle of that. And of course, there's another ironic connection with John Wayne, right? Which is that, didn't he win the uh, Best Actor Award the Oscar that year for Mr. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You had both Hoffman and Voight were nominated for Midnight right. Cowboy, but John Wayne was nominated for True Grit. And Wayne had never won the Oscar. And, and nope. you know, he was the odds on favorite. And sure enough, he got it. Uh, he didn't like Midnight Cowboy very much in his famous interview. Yeah. In that famous interview with Playboy magazine where he's, you know, denigrating Native Americans and African Americans and just about everyone else in sight, he denigrates the movie. And again, I won't use the language he uses. Mm -hmm. At the same time, though, he told friends uh, that he thought Hoffman and Voigt were really, really good in it, that that was acting. Damn it, he said. Uh -huh. yes. <laughs> Two people, including my Madison uh, friend, Stu Levitan, ask a variation of the same question. About one of the two, I would say, 
scenes that people can remember from 50 years, even if they can't remember anything else. Hmm. And that one of them is Dustin Hoffman, hey, I'm walking here, I'm walking here. Did he improvise that? How did that come up? You know, Hoffman for years has told the story that that taxi cab came out of nowhere uh -huh. uh, and just happened to be trying to run the red light, getting through while he and Voigt were trying to get on the cross, you know, by on the crosswalk. Uh, and that the timing of it, you know, pushed them into the cab and that he just improvised from there. That, that story is sort of half true. Uh -huh. The taxi cab scene is a moment is in the script. It's in the screenplay in a draft six months before the movie's made. But what, it, what isn't in the script is the dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, in the original script, uh, Ratso just sort of flicks off the cab and slams, slams his fist down and flicks off the cab angrily and they walk away. Hoffman, I don't know if it's because the cab came so close to his legs or uh, or if he had, had planned this out ahead, but didn't tell anyone, Hoffman is the one who puts together that line, I'm walking here, I'm walking here, and then a few other things and, and you know, yells out uh, some obscenities and gets it going. So Hoffman deserves full credit, I think, for really taking this exactly in a place. And after he does that, Schlesinger runs up to him and says, what did you say? What did you do? Can we do that again? And then they do it with the tech, you know, they, they film it a couple of times to get what they got. But Hoffman deserves full credit for the dialogue, but what he doesn't deserve is full credit for the fact that the taxi cab is in the middle of the crosswalk. That reminds me of another thing that he doesn't deserve credit for and luckily didn't happen, which was, didn't he want to make Ratso an even less appealing character by infusing race into it? Yeah, you know, when you hire Dustin Hoffman or John Voigt, you're going to get a lot of ideas, right. and especially Dustin Hoffman. And, and he felt that Ratso, you know, he embodied Ratso and the notion that Ratso had a lot of pride and that was a tough son of a gun and that uh, he would also, so racism would be part of that, that he would have people who he looked down upon as well. And he even tried to convince Schlesinger to do a scene where he'd be sitting in a, in a coffee shop on the stool and a, and a black man would come and sit next to him and Hoffman would get up and Ratso would get up and disgust and leave. And Schlesinger looked at him and said, oh, that's a great idea. We've already got a movie about two down and outers in New York that everyone's going to hate. Um, and it's going to be so tough. And, and, and you're, you'd like to add this race, racist element to it. I'll take it under consideration, thank you very much. And uh, that was the last anybody ever heard of it. Hoffman tells that story now with great humor. Yeah. Taking that phrase that everybody's gonna hate to the next logical question. Um, you mentioned earlier that they thought they were gonna lose money on it. Did they make money on it? Was this a financial success? Nobody expected it to make a dime to the point where, you know, when, when Schlesinger and Hellman asked for more money for themselves, United Artists said, well, we'll give you 60% of the net of this movie because 60% of nothing is nothing. Um, they were sure that they would never have to pay off on that. But the surprising thing to everyone, including Schlesinger and Hellman, was that the movie not only was a critical success, but it was a box office hit. Yes. The lines started lining up the day the film opened and they kept on and they made, that movie made something like $45 million that year, which was made it the second best movie of the year. I think interestingly, Hoffman had a lot to do with that. Mm. He was already a big star because of The Graduate. People knew who he was. He was attracting the younger audience. And here he was not playing this, you know, uh, uh, white bread Benjamin Braddock character anymore, but playing this down and out guy with the stubble and the, and the limp and everything. And he got great reviews and, and young people flocked to that movie to see him. And, you know, they were ready, I think as well for, for a more adult movie for all the things we've been talking about tonight. So the movie did very, very well financially. Um, when it got knocked down to an hour, of course, then it opened up in a lot of movie houses that wouldn't play an X-rated movie. And it had a very, very good two years. And, and the winners were Jerry Hellman and John Schlesinger, who each became millionaires right. based on the net that they got from this film. Perfect. And I, I forget, what were the, the big critics saying about it? Pauline Kael, et cetera. Pauline Kael did not love this I, movie. I didn't think uh, so. Andrew Saras of The Village Voice, her, her strong rival, he didn't love this movie either. Um, 
they didn't like Schlesinger's camera tricks and some of the flash cuts and things he was doing and the way he was roaming around New York. Some New Yorkers love this movie and other New Yorkers say it was made by a tourist, you know, mm -hmm. because it, it's so uh, it's so dark. Uh, but Vincent Canby of the New York Times captured how good it was. He said it was raw and, and, and just heartrending. Other people like Archer Winston in the New York Post, they love the actors. Uh, even the people, even like Pauline Kael, who didn't love the movie, loved John Voight and Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. Thought they were quite wonderful in it. And, you know, in some way, and that is the heart of the movie, that that partnership and these two guys, these two wonderful actors. I mean, I, I don't think there's a better pair of male actors in a mainstream American movie than Hoffman and Voight and Midnight Cowboy. And so that kind of captured the day. And in retrospectives about the movie years later, people were saying, yeah, this is, a, you know, this is an enduring movie. And I think that's the reason why we still find it interesting to watch now. Just as you can't think of the movie without those two actors. In a funny way, you can't think of it without Nielsen, right? I mean, without, without everybody's talking, that song is so much evoking the movie. And apparently it could have been, what, Bob Dylan? Or yeah. something much more contemporary uh, in that sense? Well, Dylan was interested. In fact, he wrote Lay, Lady, Lay with the idea that it would be in the movie, but he turned it in very late. Uh, and, and it wasn't what Schlesinger was interested in in the end. Uh, he, he found uh, everybody's talking off a Nielsen album, Ariel Ballet. Uh, ironically, the only song on the album that Nielsen himself didn't write. Fred yes. Neal, this, this Greenwich Village folk singer wrote it. And it's, Fred's version is also beautiful, but it's much mm -hmm. slower. Mm -hmm. John really found that it, the, the lyrics and the music sort of captured the, the, the you know, uh, the poignancy of Joe Buck. It's, it's told from inside his head. Everybody's talking at me. I don't hear a word they're saying. You know, the loneliness that he felt and the search he had for a place where he could go, you know, going where the, uh, the ocean suits my clothes, all of that captured, uh, but not in a literal way, you know, in a much more intuitive, emotional way, enigmatic way, what Joe Buck was about. And it happens to be a beautiful song. I love talking to the people who produced it and to John Sebastian uh, from The Love and Spoonful, who was a close friend of Fred Neal's and said the song uh -huh. beautifully epitomized Fred's own attitude uh -huh. toward life. And I think Schlesinger uses it brilliantly in the film. And it's one of the things we always remember from. Oh, of course. And you couldn't really use Lay Lady Lay and have that wonderful scene of, of John Voight, of Joe Buck, of his head above the crowd walking through the streets of New York, right? No, no. Schlesinger cut the movie to mid, you know, to everybody's talking. Uh, and originally he thought he'd have to get rid of it at some point. But the longer, the more he heard from other people, Joni Mitchell wrote a song for him that was way uh -huh. too literal for his uh -huh. taste. Uh -huh. He kept coming back to everybody's talking. And we're, I think, you know, he knew what he wanted. That's the thing about John Schlesinger. When he knew what he wanted, he refused to compromise. He wouldn't do what the studio wanted. They wanted a different song that they could own the rights to. Mm -hmm. uh, he wouldn't change the violence scene toward the end of the movie. He insisted on what he thought was the truth that he was looking at. And in this movie, it just happens to be incredibly successful and work for him. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess uh, a final question, we're past seven o'clock. Um, two variations of the same question. One person asked, will there or could there be a remake of Midnight Cowboy? And another person asked, if they did remake it, would they have to change it today? I don't know why you would do it. I, I, just like I don't know how you could remake The Searchers uh, mm -hmm. after John Wayne's performance. And I thought about that a lot of times, mm -hmm. or High Noon for that matter, after Gary Cooper. I think these performances are so good, uh, uh, all of them, but especially Void and Hoffman, yep. and so contemporary in their way. This kind of acting never grows old. It's you know, it's kind of like trying to make a film of, you know, Streetcar Named Desire. You can do, play, you know, you can do it on the stage. And there has been a stage version of Midnight Cowboy, but oh. it wasn't successful. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think you can exceed or even begin to match. And I don't know actors who'd be willing to try. I think you could make a movie about the making of the movie. I think yes. you could make a movie. You make a movie off your book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, Let's David. Oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, 
that may never happen, as we know. But nonetheless, I think well, they did it with Apocalypse. They can do it with you, right? <laughs> <laughs> these characters are so interesting, and they're so. I mean, I loved writing about these people, and they're you know what they went through, and how they worked with each other, and how even now the ones who are still around look back at that movie, you know, with so much affection. Every one of them uh, that you know. No, I don't. I don't think you can make the movie again. Hollywood can make edgy movies these days, folks. I mean, all it takes now is an iPhone if you really want to go out on the streets of New York, and people are doing that. I have a lot of faith in younger people making movies these days and what they'll come up with. But Midnight Cowboy, no, I I think it has to stay where it is, or at least that's my strong opinion. Great. Well, Glenn, this has been a lot of fun talking, and well, thank you. And break a leg out on the tour. Thanks, David. It's great to talk to you. Yeah, great moderating, David. And uh, you know, sometimes it it takes a writer to know what what to ask a writer. Uh, and Glenn, um, I don't know about Hollywood making a, a, a movie out, out of out of you. Why not? Come but, on. But 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 let me just say this Sorry. book and and Glenn's other film books are really a good reason why the Academy ought to invent an Oscar for books about movies. Hey, that's a great. Because, yeah, because, you know, Glenn, Glenn keeps finding ways to make us appreciate even more uh, the movies that he writes about uh, and even already iconic movies. Mm -hmm. so, to everyone watching, uh, thanks again for tuning in. A reminder that in the chat, you can find a link to, uh, to purchase a shooting Midnight Cowboy. And from all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read.